pleasure to be here. And get my slides up here. Be great. All right. Thank you. So uh, I've been to Kerala a few times. Last time, several years ago, I uh, had the pleasure of doing an Ayurvedic diet uh, just down the street. And, uh, I, I lost some weight back then, but I got it back, as you can see. But it's a great pleasure to be back in India. Uh, as you know, uh, the future is not invented in Europe. The future is invented in the countries that are going to be the next big countries, not the countries that they have to call developing countries, but primarily India, Brazil, China, countries like this. And it's very interesting to see what we're seeing now is that technology is now coming for the wrong slide here. We should start at the beginning. Uh, technology is now becoming the driving factor of society. If you're looking around, you can clearly see a couple of very interesting things like Google, for example. I do quite a bit of work with Google. Uh, Google is now becoming an artificial intelligence company. That's a scary thought also. Because right? Google knows more about you than your husband or your wife. Because of all the eight years that you've put in all information to Google, and the mobile OS, right, Google has very deep information. Just imagine in five years, do you really think you're going to sit at a machine like this and type in best sushi in Trivandrum? The machine will already know who you are, what you want to eat, what your friends have eaten, where they have eaten, and you just speak. I was in the Intel Labs uh, last year, and I was sitting on the couch watching the next uh, generation of television. And you sit on the couch and you say, I want to see House of Cards episode 3, where he kills the guy in the garage with a, with a, with a car, right? And it will play instantly. No searching, no typing, speaking, gesturing, thinking. Now, that sounds really good. But of course, there are many issues here. As you know, there's a lot of really hard things about human intelligence. Uh, when you talk about artificial intelligence, AI, there's so many confusions about this, right? Really what AI is emulating humans in a very basic sense. And guess what? It is extremely difficult to emulate people. Language. It's being, it's being worked on a very, very difficult track. Very difficult. Vision. I mean, the computer can now understand that the picture on the internet is a cat, right? But it won't know if it's a dead cat or a live cat, right? Unless it's obviously dead. Right? Motion. Computers can't walk. It's very difficult to walk. Right? Robots can walk, but it's extremely difficult to walk correctly. So there's many things that we're seeing here that are just now being worked on and we're now at the point of where these things are becoming possible. They're no longer science fiction. So my work as a futurist, I'll, I'll give you a, a bit, of, bit of a background here. And by the way, I, I currently live in Switzerland, uh, but I spent 17 years in the US as an internet entrepreneur and also as a musician and producer. So uh, if I speak very excitedly and use the word awesome, that's my American part, right? Uh, if I uh, speak very gently and slowly and don't take any risk, that's my Swiss part. But I was born in Germany, so if I, if I put fear into you, that's my German part. And that will be a bit of fear today, right? So basically as a futurist I do this, right? I don't do predictions. All of you would do the very same thing that I'm doing. You just have to inverse the work that you're doing on today to focus on tomorrow. All of you know what's going to happen in five years, not 50 years, right? All of you have a good idea of what's going to happen in five years, but we're very busy working today. Right? So I reverse the time. My clients spend all their time working on this quarter and this year, and I spend all of my time thinking about what could happen in five years. So it's really a 
observation. There's a great saying in China where people say, if you want to know about the future, ask your children. And so I would give that advice to you because the children will show you what the future is. Right? My company, the Futures Agency, based in uh, Switzerland, also in San Francisco, our motto is, it wasn't raining before Noah built the ark. You may know Noah from the Bible, the guy that built the ark to save mankind. Very important to find out that what is happening is a lot of companies are under significant pressure to reinvent. And you know the reinvention started in one place that's very dear to me, the music business. Remember Napster? Right? The late 90s, 75 million down, uh, uh, software downloads in four weeks for free music. And so first music was disrupted, and then movies and films, and then the publishing business, news, magazine, print, that's next. And guess what's number four in that industry? Financial. Financial is becoming like media. We will see the same disruption in the financial business as advice, banking, money, transactions that we see in music. So we have tremendous changes, and it's very important for people to anticipate what those changes are. You know that the music business was famous. There's only four people who ran the music business, right? It was essentially a cartel. So Sony, Warner, EMI, and Universal. And when the internet came around, the late 90s, the record label, I was working with the record label, they said, we don't like the fact that the consumer can do what they want you know, download for free and stream and share music, you know, we will try to stop this. The music industry sued, went to court for 259,000 people in 10 years. And only one of them went to trial. And they lost 72% revenues in 10 years. Imagine if they would have spent the energy on thinking about a solution for what people want, rather than stopping people from what they could do. So I would advise you, if you're in the business of financial or any other technology, you have to take a look at what people want. It's unstoppable. And what we're seeing right now is, of course, cloud computing, social, mobile, intelligent assistance. We're moving into a world that sometimes may look like a science fiction movie. On that note, please, you people are always, you know, uh, most of you, I'm, I'm sure, you are really into motion pictures. I am. I watch all of those movies, you know, from Oblivion to Transcendence to Ex Machina. Okay? When we talk about artificial intelligence, emulating humans, forget Hollywood, please. This is entertainment. It's meant, it's meant to incite fear and, you know, it's meant to entertain, right? <coughs> what we see in those movies is not what is going to be relevant for us. It's always the worst case scenario. <laughs> Robots taking over the world. Yes, there is a potential for that, yes. Yeah, we could also have an asteroid hitting the Earth, right? So please forget about Hollywood and let's go back to what we see in our, in our real life, okay? What we see in our real life is this, and you can see this in India, in all the big cities, the convergence of man and machine. The convergence of what we can do as people and what technology does for us. Our technology is extremely empowering, like social media. We can go and use TripAdvisor and say bad things about the restaurant, we can go to our college and grade our professor so that the other people can, we can make a comment on Facebook, we can research things and compare practices, right, it's empowerment. Uh, at the same time, of course, now we have artificial intelligence already in like 50 products. When you use Google Maps, that is artificial intelligence. Google Maps says, oh, I know, Manish, right? I know where he's been, or he likes, who he's connected to, where he is, and I make a match, and I send him the right messages, right? That, that's kind of intelligent, kind of, a very simple level. 
But you know what happens when we meet in person? When any of us will meet in person later, it takes an average of 3.5 seconds between us to, to exchange so much information. And that information is not outspoken, right? It's unspoken. That the computer will take three months, any computer in the world, to deliver that much information to each other. Because there's many things that we don't say that we, that we mean, right? And there's many things that we don't mean when we say them. And so it's very important to remember that what we're trying to do is not to emulate people as we are people. That is not going to be possible for quite some time. At least I hope. But to use technology as a utility, not as a religion. <laughs> there is a difference. Okay? So when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're talking about a utility. We're talking about one of the most powerful tools given to us in the next, well, it's already here, but in the next five to ten years. We'll revolutionize pretty much every single tool. And we should keep in mind, just like we use TripAdvisor, TripAdvisor is widely used in India, right? Correct? Well, you know what it is, right? Rating restaurants and hotels. When you use TripAdvisor, sometimes when you go to a hotel or restaurant, it's 100% correct, right? Not very often. Sometimes it's 100% wrong. So TripAdvisor is a, a data part, right? If you were to live your life, based on TripAdvisor, you'd be in deep trouble. It's good, but you would never live your life based on TripAdvisor. Would you, live, would you marry the right woman or man based on the DNA analysis, which is not possible, right? I mean, we shouldn't make the mistake of saying that the data that we get seems like the truth, right? It's just one piece of it. Let's keep that in mind when we talk about uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, Ray Kurzweil, who is probably the most famous futurist, and I would urge you to read his book called The Singularity is Near. I'll explain later what that means. Ray Kurzweil says in The Singularity Hub, it says, basically the future holds for man and machine is convergent of man and machine. And of course, he's very, he's very extreme representative of futurism, right? He says that we will connect our brains to the cloud. Basically connect our brain directly to the internet. That is actually his proposal. So here is something very important to understand when we talk about Ray Kurzweil and singularity of the future of artificial intelligence. It's called the Moravec paradox, and you can look it up on Wikipedia. But it's a very simple idea, okay? What is extremely easy for the computer is very hard for people. And what is very easy for computers is, is very hard for people. Let's say it again. Oh, sorry. What is easy for computers is hard for people. What is easy for people is hard for computers. So a computer can be pretty much anyone in chess. Has been for many years. Pretty much anyone. But a computer cannot talk to a two-year-old child, which is not very intelligent in the sense of you know, playing chess, right? And so that is our challenge. When you're engineering software, you're always going to be up against this one point. What we as humans do is very hard to copy. What machines do is actually very good for us to have. For example, a doctor having IBM Watson, you know, making the rounds of the hospital. The doctor can have access to 100,000 cases of the same cancer through the machine. Very powerful. So that's important to keep in mind that paradox. Now also, we're living in an exponential world. There's a great book that just came out by a friend of mine called The Exponential Organization. Uh, it's, it's very American, and it's very like, you know, pro-technology, but you should read it. Okay? Uh, both, uh, the guy's called Louis van Gaes, is part of Singularity. Now this curve is probably the most important curve in your lives. You know what it means? It means that we're no longer at Moore's Law in the beginning of this curve. We're no longer over here on the left, you know, when you're on the left in the mid-90s on the internet, 
if you double 0 0.0.01, you still have nothing. But now we're doubling 1, 2, 4, 8. And we're now at 4. The next point after 4, Moore's law, right? The next point after 4 is 8. So it's a mind-boggling suite. Now we're at the takeoff point of exponential technology. That's not just artificial intelligence. Bioengineering, nanotechnology, geoengineering, solar power, 3D printing. I mean, if you put all these things together, you think you've come straight out of Blade Runner, you know, or some movie like this. So you're very lucky to be at this point. There's very many business opportunities. But you also have to keep an eye on the side effects. Most of the development in the next five to ten years will include some computer emulating humans. Uh, I don't know if you've tried the latest version of Siri, but it's just coming out. You know, Apple has just created an update that's coming out. You may have seen on the WWC video uh, the introduction. Basically, this, this system will be capable of uh, speaking to you like a person. You can speak to Siri and say, last year, or last time I was in Kerala, show me all the pictures of me and my wife on the beach. And it will find them for you, like, like a person. That's all happening, coming within me. Imagine what that could do for personal services. You're saying, I want to invest in real estate in Sydney, Australia. Can you find the places that are closest to the beach, not yet populated with rich individuals, that have an average weather temperature of 26 degrees, and where there's lots of Indians and maybe some Germans, you know, go find this. 14, 14 seconds later, boom, right there, huge report. Sent to your brain with a wireless interface. <laughs> maybe not. This is a company that uh, Mark Zuckerberg has founded from Facebook called Vicarious. He spent $150 million. The company is funded with $550 million. And look at the headline. We're building software that thinks and learns like a human. I mean, only Americans would say that, right? I mean, if I would say that, I would say we're building software that copies what it means to be a human, right? Or tries to parallelize. Can you build software that thinks and learns like a human? That, that, now, that is an extremely tall order, right? That is like saying you want sentient machines, conscious machines. The Google self-driving car, which I had the pleasure to drive in a few years ago, the self-driving car by Google is an extremely complicated and smart machine. Okay? But this car, when it goes down the road, pretty much anywhere now in California, and you have a double yellow line, you have a frog on the road, the car will see the frog, and if you're lucky, it will know it's a frog, right? But it will say, it's a frog with a double yellow line. I cannot cross the line, it's forbidden. I cannot kill the frog, it's forbidden. I cannot endanger the frog by going over it very slowly, as we will probably die. So what does the car do? Shut down, right? End of, end of the road. Cannot decide. You know what a human driver would do? One tenth of a thousandth of a, of a second. We would make an instant decision what to do. Kill the frog, cross the line, do something. It's not, it's not important, right? It's a frog for crying out loud, right? Yeah, you want to keep the frog alive. You would kill the frog before you kill a schoolgirl, right? So that is actually quite difficult to build software. And there's a great story about exponentiality that you may know as actually an Indian story. When the chessboard was invented, the inventor came to the, uh, was the Moti Empire, 500 before Christ. Uh, he came to the, to the uh, court of the emperor and he said, uh, here's a chessboard and, they, and the emperor loved the chess game. They made a bet. And the wise man said, uh, well, if I win, I only want to be able to feed my family. You may know the story pretty well now. But uh, make a long story short, when the uh, wise man said, I just want you to put one corn of rice from the first field, and then double for the second field, and then double for the fourth, third field, right? 
exponentially for each field. And the emperor said, oh, you're really a modest man. It's agreed. If you win, you get double as many rice points for each field. In the middle of the game, he realized this. By the time he got to the middle of the game, he already owed the guy who was about to win all of the rice in India. All of it. At the end of the game, he would have owed the wise man one meter of rice covering the entire globe. Like 150 trillion points. And this is what exponential technology is. And guess what? We're here now, right? We're in the second part of the chess game. And we're at the point where we're exponentially more, right? It's not just little stuff like one, two, four, eight, right? This is 150 trillion, 300 trillion, you know. That's what's happening with science and technology. Humanity will change more in the next 20 years, like I said in the video, than in the previous 300. And half of these changes are driven by technology, the rest is driven by economics, of course, which is related, obviously. So in technology, it used to be, when I first got on the internet in 1995, the question was, can we do this? How much will it cost to build this, right? That was the question. You know what the question is today? The question is not whether we can do it. The answer is always yes, always. Can we mine the asteroids? We can. I mean, it's hard, but we can. Can we uh, set up solar systems around the Earth and transport the energy? No, we can, right? It looks like we can. Can we change the seawater into sweet water? Now we found technology soon that can. Right? It's mind boggling how this has changed, right? Here's a great example of Uber, right? The uh, taxi company. You guys know Uber, right? Uh, it's basically, you, you have an app and you call a uh, on-demand car, like a taxi. It's a very big change. And Uber has announced, of course, the American company, you know, speaking about how they want to dominate the world, but uh, basically Uber has announced that they will have self-driving autonomous cars that they're going to invest in. And here's an astounding number, right? The Columbia University study says that 9,000 cars, automated cars, could replace all of the taxi cabs in New York City. And people would wait only 36 seconds and pay 50 cents per mile. Faster, cheaper, greener, more efficient, huh? and we would lose 185,000 taxi drivers. That's going to be a long time in India until that happens, right? But for obvious reasons, the traffic is slightly different there. But that's how exponential change is happening. So in this book, they're talking about, this is one of the graphs in the book, The Exponential Organization. They're talking about the sweet spot. This is where you are right now. You're in the sweet spot right here. And the sweet spot of exponential is right the place of disruption between linear progress and exponential progress. That's where software is at right now. We're now at the point to where we can use that gap between the things that, that used to work linear. And my friend, uh, my friend uh, Frank Diana, who worked for Tata Consulting, he came up with this really interesting list of things that are happening around us now. You probably know most of those. Autonomous vehicles, the shared economy, connected healthcare, smart cities, 3D printing, I mean, this list, you can download the slides later, by the way. There's lots of information here. Um, so what's important to notice with all these topics, it's not just exponential. It is also combinatorial. So that means everything on this graph happens at the same time. The Internet of Things, big data, social media, cloud computing, lower prices, cognitive systems, robotics, they're all coming together. So if you're building software, you need to know about all the things that are around it. And that is the challenge, I think, that we're no longer just about one thing. And artificial intelligence, of course, is part of all of these changes. So now the software business is jumping from the little, little bowl that we were in before to a much larger bowl. <clears throat> Mark Andreessen, the founder of Netscape, and now of venture capitalism in the Bay Area, he said already four years ago, software is eating the world. Yeah, that's very true. Everything that we used to know, 
that's hardware is now software. Music, films, books, magazines. And people are still reading printed magazines in India. Yeah? True. That's a whole lot. In the US and in Germany and in Germany. So everything that used to be hardware is software. And everything that used to be software is now called an experience. Like Airbnb, like Uber, like Dropbox. So Marshall McLuhan, who was a very smart futurist, he said it's the framework that changes with technology, not just the frame, not just the picture. So if you build a software for artificial intelligence, for services for your clients, you cannot think of one tiny picture. You have to think of the frame. That's where the opportunity is. If you're very good at building pictures, that's great. But we're talking about an ecosystem here, right? When the banks are changing to embrace digital, and the millennials, you know, the, the people who are about 30 now, are going to buy those services, they're going to buy into an ecosystem. They're not just going to buy one tiny thing. So we have to build an ecosystem. And we also must look at this, right? I mean, it's, it's amazing what is happening with computing. When I started uh, using computers, you know, roughly 15 uh, years ago, so I was actually pretty late with this. Yeah? You know, you had to type and sit in front of a box. Most of your kids will not grow up with a computer being a box. Right? But where's the computer? It's in the air. It's everywhere. The computer's in the cloud. Right? It's like water. You speak to it. I said, it's a scary concept, right? I mean, cloud computing basically means we don't need devices. It, it, we just connect in any which way we can. And so, what is happening here is we're going from typing to speaking to gesturing to blinking in our brain computer interface to thinking. You think that's science fiction? It's not. I'm not sure I would want a computer that can connect to my thinking, right? You have to be the judge of that. But the interface that changes so quickly in Microsoft HoloLens, if you've seen that, right? The Oculus Rift. That's for geeks. In five years, as normal as a mobile phone. So in five years, if you're a financial advisor or insurance company or whatever, right, you wear an augmented outfit, you can deal with so much data in one minute that it used to take you all day to do a knock on the computer. Remember the scene from Minority Report when he goes inside the data like this, he takes the data out like this, but over here, and you know, structures the data. If you're a doctor, you can reach inside of the data, right? That's already happening, it's just too expensive. So a great tweet here from Adam Le uh, Aaron Levy just a few weeks ago. He says, enterprise software used to be about making existing work more efficient. A lot of you are involved with that. That's good work, but the future is to transform the work itself. The future of artificial intelligence and software is not just more efficiency. That, that is a good thing, right? You can make money with efficiency but it's to transform the world. India has many call centers, many of them around here. They know what's going to happen to call centers, right? And we're talking basically the language recognition that computers are able to do now. We give it five years, we can have 90% less people in call centers. Right? I mean, there are so many companies working. I looked this up last night on the Angel VC list. There's like a thousand people looking to kill call centers, right? Funded companies. You may say it's very hard, right? It's very hard to listen to people. And, but the stuff I've seen for call centers, that's mind boggling. There's been a test with a company I shall not name, but a hundred thousand people called this call center. Only four of them said it was a computer. Four from a hundred thousand. We're talking about very simple stuff like we book a flight or something, right? Not like therapy or Very simple things, right? So that's going to really change society. What are we going to do with all those people? It has a very big societal impact. 
So the other thing is that when I was going back to the, uh, the Hollywood motion pictures, then, when you're looking at the future of artificial intelligence, you do not want to look at the what I call the superhuman stuff, right? The things that are out of movies, right? Really what we're talking about, and it's very important to remember, we're talking about adding value for utility. That's the mission. The mission is not to copy humans, but to make humans unneeded. You can try that. I think it's a stupid idea. I think in 50 years we can talk about that again. You know, it may also be a very dangerous place then. But you know that people, 98% of transactions are not based on logical decisions. 98%. Car purchases, almost 100%. We use logic to make an argument that we should listen to what we want to do in the first place. Right? Investment decisions? We need utility. We don't need somebody's brain to replace ours. Again, you could try that. I think it's doomed for failure. That would be like saying, every time I go out, I go to where TripAdvisor tells me. Not a good idea. It's very useful, right? very useful. But removing humanity from the process here, basically what we're looking at here is intelligence aug augmentation. Using technology to augment me. To make me quicker and faster and more efficient, but not to remove my decision making. To give me a kind of super intelligence. If you can give your clients super intelligence, they will pay you trillions of dollars for that, right? If you try to remove your clients from being part of the process, they will kill you. What is the human purpose of being in business when you're not involved and it's just a machine? So, predictive analytics, that's useful. The system tells me that most likely I will need to have another 100,000 SKUs ready to go next week. That's very useful. But at the same time, I can always say, you know, I, I think this is interesting, but the system's kind of giving me an inclination, but I, I have another opinion, right? We take this question, for example, a really interesting question. You know that all the major airlines around the world want to not have airplanes with pilots, right? Well, because they don't want strikes. You know, they don't want people messing up the machines, right? And you know, it's pretty much proven that an airplane without a pilot would be safer. And it's pretty much proven. I mean, the discussions are ongoing, right? But in most cases, when the pilot has to take over from the automatic pilot, he cannot respond so quickly. He fails to respond. That's been the cause of most accidents. But, having said that, right, would you go into a flying robot to fly from Toronto to Dubai without a person in the front? Would, would you enter such a flying robot? Well, many of you say, of course, yeah, this. So the argument is clear, huh? Right? The data says yes, but we're saying often. Maybe not. Right? So there are there is a difference there. And very important is that if you're building software and you're architecting things, you need to think about the, the ecosystem. What is, what is all the stuff that you're impacting? How are you changing the food chain? If you're building intelligence for financial systems or insurances or government, right, you're going to change the way that the work works for them. Right? You're going to impact the whole food chain, not just a piece of it. I mean, the fact that, that 1.3 billion people are using Google Maps is changing everything in the food chain. Where they go to, which route they take, how they can be monitored, surveillance, Take the example of Tesla. Tesla is the best example of a company that thinks about an ecosystem. You know Tesla, the car company, of course, right? Many of you probably have one. I'm just kidding. Uh, would be kind of uh, tough to drive, I think, in many places where you don't have the batteries. But it's an interesting car. But anyway, Tesla is not a car company. They happen to also make cars. They have a database. They make technology. 
now they need battery. Tomorrow they will solve the energy problem distributing solar energy. You think of Tesla as a car company, so do I, right? But they're not. They're a company that is building the system of energy distribution, and the car is one of the outlets. So when you think like this, it's called lateral thinking. The market gets much bigger. So to, to create those value propositions, you know, think a little bit better. So that is the ecosystem. Right? What you're building here today, or starting today, or already starting, by using artificial intelligence is a new ecosystem, a new logic. Not just a new software. If you're building artificial intelligence for call centers, you change the entire structure of what happens there. Can the uh, software anticipate? Yeah, it's entirely possible. I mean, if, uh, for example, I was uh, delayed on my way down here, right? So if that happens, the software can already anticipate the rebook before if you see the person on that plane, the very second the pilot says we're not going. Right? The software can do that in, in two seconds. Right? You know how long the people take in the call center for that? And how much confusion they cause? But what would be the ideal ecosystem? Right? Look at these numbers. This is a McKinsey study. Talking about the potential economic impact of disruptive technologies. Each one of those is based on artificial intelligence. Again, you can download the slides later, but it's automation of knowledge work, robotics, autonomous vehicles, the Internet of Things, mobile internet. And each one of those is also something where India could take leadership. Right? I mean, this is really, really hardcore work here. This is not some ephemeral stuff. Right? There's a lot of infrastructure, a lot of engineering, a lot of thinking, right? and there's a new ecosystem of this, uh, um, McKinley says, $30 trillion a year. So I want to show you this quick uh, video because it explains also that when you're inventing something, the timing has to be right and the context has to be right. right? This is a quick uh, clip about a self-driving car. Introducing the all-new self-driving car. It does the driving for you, so you can catch up on the more important things in life. It automatically takes the right turns. It effortlessly avoids unexpected obstacles. You can see this on, uh, on YouTube. The point is, the self-driving car may work, but we're not prepared for what it does at all, right? For the consequences of what it does. Uh, and how it would work. The context is crucial. So when you're inventing something like this, you have to find a context. And you have to make sure that the context is ready for it. For example, if you're, if you're a Tesla, you know, if you're rolling out uh, electric cars all over the world, right? Well, it's kind of a problem when there's no place to charge, right? So you have a great car, you go to feel the miles, you're dead, you're dead, you're finished, right? There's no context. So the context is crucial, and uh, uh, Dave Evans, who was a futurist for Intel, said that basically, as a context, we're going to be surrounded by intelligence, right? And uh, I think the uh, real check of that is really this, right? Um, Think of a world like this, right? Think of a world where our brains are being uh, essentially described as a piece of equipment. It's very much a disembodied way of looking at business. And many people that I, that I work with, they're thinking, okay, if we can make the business totally efficient and safe personnel, do away with people and essentially create copies of human processes that are in machines. For example, take the shipping business, right? I was in Greece a couple of weeks ago and talked to the shipping companies. What they want to do is they want to basically have completely unmanned container ships. 
Well, that's like three hundred people on a container ship, right? They want to put five people on the ship in ten years. Five people. It's a robot, essentially, right? The machine will be a robot. Right? Now, for that, I can see the logic, right? Nobody really wants to be on that ship, right? I can I can see how that could work. But you take things like advice, especially financial. Right? Well. When you have ten thousand dollars to invest, but you want to invest in a really safe investment, that's pretty simple, right? You can you can do that. But anything else, this is probably not the right approach because you know there's a cartoon that I found the other day that says it pretty well. The cartoon says, "No, you weren't downloaded," says the mother to the child. You were born. That's a very big difference. We cannot treat our business customers as if they were an algorithm downloaded from the internet. So, for example, visuality. Now, understanding visuals is a pretty mind-boggling challenge that is just now being solved. Uh, the Facebook system can recognize the difference in those two different kinds of dogs. Would even be hard for humans to do. So, here's a question I have for you. Would you trust an assistant, a robot, with a visor like this? Would you trust it? Well, that is the ultimate question. If you are a financial service provider, or pretty much anywhere in the world, no matter what the advice would be, will say, well, this is the smartest machine we have, right? Would you do this? Would you put your head to sleep on an elephant? Trust in the elephant not to kill you. And she has this kind of trust in the system like this. Well, the answer is, what is the answer? Uh, maybe a little bit, yeah? Maybe something else could give me more trust. Like, people don't trust algorithms. Algorithms can certainly destroy the trust, or amplify it, or emulate it. I think at a certain point that is becoming a major issue in the work that we do. How do we actually think, you know, do we really want to delete humanity in our world? That is a very bad idea. Well, it's a bad idea because it will kill the world, right? <laughs> well, there's many other problems with it, but it will create useless work. Really what we want with our software, when we use artificial intelligence, is this, right? We want to liberate the planet. We want to set people free to do what they want to do in the first place. We don't want to take them over. Like, you know, in a way, you could say this is what happened with Facebook, right? I mean, basically, Facebook empowered us for a while, and now we are empowering Facebook. I mean, we are the content of Facebook. They're using us to create their assets. I don't think that's a problem. I think we just have to realize that, that what it, that's what it is, right? You know, 10 years ago, Google used to index the world of information. Today, Google is indexing us. They're using us as information. So th there's things that we have to see there, but basically I think when we build something, we have to think of it like this, right? <clears throat> we have two missions. One is technology, and the ease of use and the products that we create with this. And the other one is the human values. The ethics, the philosophy, the principles, the values, whatever you want to call it. A business that does not have ethics is dead. I mean, it's, we can't just, as you know, of course, technology doesn't have ethics. Have you met a robot that has value? Well, not yet, at least, right? I mean, there we're going to see a, quite a challenge for us in the future. So. A great ad here from this company called VIF, you should check out. They're creating a video engine based on technology. And their headline is, Intelligent Becomes Irritability. Something that we can use, something that we can riff off. And this guy from 2008, the CEO of RGA, says, when you create a utility, you're creating something that gives people time back. That's a very important statement. It becomes less about information, as pollution and more about information that help people get through life. That is a useful thing, a utility. 
Well, this is how Google has become so powerful, right? Anybody from Google in the room? <laughs> Should be careful what I say here as one of my clients, but uh, that's how Google has become powerful. It has built so much utility, right? Every time you turn around, it's like, oh, another cool thing you could do. Utility. I guarantee you, when your software that you build has so much utility that it becomes like air, becomes like oxygen. That's the future. Great article yesterday in Technology Review with a great picture that I snagged last night in the airplane. Right? You don't want this on the left. You don't want your technology to trample a client, right? You don't want your client to feel like you're doing this with them, like they're becoming a chip. But nevertheless, your service is a chip, right? It is automation. It is intelligent, right? You want this. You want the client to happily sit on top of the thing that you build. And I think that is really what the future is for this, right? It's this combination of intelligence and automation, which is inevitable. And there's been lots of studies on this. I think India is really one of the toughest places for this because automation means job loss, right? That's quite clear. It will take longer in India because of the size and the market and the infrastructure and so on, right? Maybe 10, 15 years, but automation kills jobs. And Everybody keeps saying that there's new jobs because of technology, but this time it's very radical automation. So I think it's actually good news, but really what we have to look at is like how do people fit into this? Consciousness. I mean that there is such a thing as a conscious investor for example, right? Awareness, sentience. That's the connection you need to make when you build something. Here's a video from IBM that's going to make you think. All of the problems in the world have been done immediately if men were only willing to think. All of the problems of the world. All of the inefficiencies. Complexity. Bad information. Bad decisions. Could be settled easily. All of the opportunities could be realized. If we were only willing to see patterns in data that we could never see before. Put analytics in our hands. Reinvent businesses in the cloud. Fight cybercrime with math. Design a machine that thinks like we do. If we were only willing to use data and science and curiosity to track epidemics. Well, you get the point here, right? IBM is also one of my clients. But I have to say this video is kind of strange, right? Because basically what it says, it says, if we were only willing to use technology, which is IBM's technology, we could solve everything. Right? I mean, it says right there, if you're willing to think and use data, then everything solved, right? Well, the answer is, is not. It is extremely helpful, of course, right? On the left, you see a, a symbol of what's called reductionism. Uh, and reductionism goes back to a philosopher named Descartes in the 17th century, who said, that animals could be seen to be fancy machines. So he made a picture of a duck that could be copied to be like a, what they call a robot, a machine. And lots of people took this and said, well, really, that's, you know, animals and humans, you know, they're really like fancy machines, right? And that's called reductionism. And I can, think, I can guarantee you, if your products are going to reduce humans to be a duck, that's a mechanical duck, right? it will not be successful. Reductionism is the opposite of empowerment, so it's very important, right? I mean, if you're looking at an AI-based utility, right, it needs to be holistic. I mean, this is taken from a, a wellness brochure, right? It's kind of interesting how they fit together, right? Whole creative, intuitive, open-minded, individuals connected, you know, chaotic, dynamic. Your software needs to connect with people in a holistic way. And that's a pretty hard mission. I mean, that's a very, very hard mission. Because it's not the same, it's not rules-based, right? It's not, it's not like this, right? I, I can guarantee you, if you're inventing something that's based on what's called machine thinking, it will be good for a year because it looks interesting, right? But then, what, what then? Right? So really great software, 
will transcend the machine thing. Will make humans more powerful. It will do this what I call the algorithms, and I made up this word. Right? It's called a, a neologism. Uh, Humorisms, like algorithms, right? Basically, that's that's the two worlds. You know, here's the algorithm. You know, the technology, and here's the humorism, which is essentially what happens between people. That is the sweet spot for software for the future. That's the sweet spot for artificial intelligence. That is to put those two together, not to replace the humor rhythm with an algorithm. That is a reduction. So very important to keep that in mind. When you look at these people on the left, the so-called millennials, many of you in the room are millennials. Millennials are people that were around uh, teenagers, around the turn of the, of the, uh, uh, the what you call the millennium, of course. <laughs> Right, so if you were 14 around the year 2000, you're about 30 years old now. Right? That makes you, for example, the millennial. Okay, and these people are the driving force of society in the next five to ten years. In India, it's actually people who are younger than that also, the natives, right? because of the size of the population. And guess what? The you can see it a little bit small, but guess what? The millennials are saying is the most important thing in their lives. What they expect from service providers. Right? The first point, the very first point, is they're saying they're expecting mobile-friendly sites and apps. And the second point is they're expecting some some form of human interaction. Which is direct opposite, right? First point is mobile and website technology. Second point, human interaction. And these people will be 75% of business in the next five years. Most companies will be staffed by 50 to 70% millennials, just because of how they flow with things going on, especially in engineering. So the likely continuum for the next 70 uh, to 80 years will be two things, right? I turn this around and I say, okay, basically artificial intelligence could also be perceived in the beginning to be intelligent assistance, so IA and AI. Bit of a world play, right? But basically, uh, IA is a mild version of AI. Right? So IA means intelligent augmentation, intelligent assist. All the things that are happening, for example, now you drive a car and on the freeway in Germany, you can have the car keep you in the right lane or keep a distance from the next car. That, that's, called, that's called assistance, right? And there will be tons of roles are made with intelligent assistance. So in other words, it'll be a long time before I can go on the German highway with a car that drives itself. But assistance is here now. So also in your work when you're building software, think about intelligent assistance, augmentation, the stuff that happens here that is kind of the next step, right? And basically the definition really is quite simple, right? It's not replacing workers, but augmenting their capabilities. Wearables, visualization, Virtual, mental reality, intelligence. That is the opportunity right now, today, uh, to have a mild version of artificial intelligence. For example, using glasses to visualize information, well, that's going to become very normal. You see here on the left, I mean, you're the right business now, right? This is the growth in digital assistance systems. Cortana, Siri, Google Now. That's the growth. I mean, it's it's huge. I mean, this is actually way, way too small from the Financial Times. I guarantee you, every single transaction in the in the economic sector, whether it's financial, banking, insurance, will be based on some sort of service of that sort. That's already happening, but let's give that part. Of it. So let's compare this, for example, to driving. On the left hand side, we have the Volvo car train, right? Volvo has cars that allow you to go on the freeway behind a lead car and just stay in line behind the car and let the car drive like, like a train. <coughs> it's called the car train. And it works beautifully, right? Because it's so simple. As a lead car, you stay with the lead car, everybody is in one line, you know, it, it, it works, right? This here, going 200 miles an hour, sitting in the back of the car playing a video game, or so, that is a long time ago. Uh, this is just like a pilot in the airplane. Right? 
It's possible, but would you do that, right? That's a life or death situation. So I think that the initial part of what we're doing here in terms of the possibilities of uh, technology is uh, the first part is the assistant and the intelligent assistant. And I cannot skip this part because you know there's a great uh, app called X.AI, which is a personal assistant that scheduled meetings for you. I just tried it out. <clears throat> you should give it a try. There's a, a software called Narrative Science that does the same thing for journalists and uh, Fortune magazine and Forbes. Ten percent of what they put out is already written in the software. It's like a journalist software. So this guy runs a company called Cape Show, which is a leading uh, technology company in the investment financial space. Right? He says something very interesting, and it's really what we're doing is here. We're automating human-intensive knowledge work. Look at this curve here. Right? I mean, the amount of knowledge available to us today is mind-boggling. You're going to decide which Ayurvedic clinic to go to in Kerala. 15 years ago, you call a travel agent or you ask a friend, right? Today, you have all of the information in comparison is mind boggling. You're going to uh, decide where to invest, you could study for the next 100 years. This is the curve in the exponential growth of knowledge. To solve that problem for your customers is huge. Automating human intensive knowledge work, that's what he described as a goal. And as I said before, you know, when you have a virtual world, and when you have a world that is based on the screen, remotely, you're looking at this beach saying, oh, that looks interesting, right? That's five to 10%, if you're lucky, of reality, because you look through a screen, right? You're not actually there. And even if the screen is virtual or 3D, right? Now here, nice beaches of, of, uh, of Trivandrum, I think this is, actually, no, this is Goa, I think, sorry. A little bit further up there. When you're on the beach, in the, sitting right there, it's 100%. Does that mean that the screen with the information is bad? It doesn't. As long as we know what the difference is. There is a difference. We can use both, right? This is about the left brain and the right brain. The right brain is about imagination, discussion, emotion, understanding, synthesis, you know, all the stuff that's essentially more creative. The left brain is the engineering brain, right? <laughs> Algorithms, logic. Now here's a good or a bad message for you if you're in the software business. You're going to have to work a lot more with the right brain now. Because the synthesis of the two is really where the action is. Understanding how that all sits together, right? Uh, Poincaré said, uh, a philosopher said, logic proves intuition discovered. If you make the big decision about where to buy a house, you can use logic, but you know that ultimately you're not deciding entirely based on logic. We should not ignore that because that is actually a human process that we need to maintain. Kevin Kelly said, machines are for answers, humans are for questions. Do not remove the question with the software. Amplify the question. I think that is really what it comes down to. Also, the fallacy that an artificial intelligence could have no opinion. Do you really believe that a system that's based on algorithms and computing and data is unbiased? That is a crazy idea, right? The very fact that you're removing human factors from that whole system is a bias, right? I mean, you, you feed the machine what you get out from the machine, right? The machine can learn something, but it has a bias that it's a machine, right? That's the bias of the machine. Don't think for a minute that your system will be unbiased, neutral opinion about investment or whatever, right? It's not. But it's still extremely useful. So that, that shouldn't be the goal of artificial intelligence, to be unbiased, right? I mean, why? Our lives are entirely unbiased, unqualified, chaotic. Why would we want a machine that 
that's like the ultimate truth. I'll skip this for a second. So, the other thing to keep in mind is that ultimately software and artificial intelligence makes things a lot more efficient. For example, it has been proven that if in the energy sector we would use artificial intelligence and sensor networks and the Internet of Things to connect energy grids and home heating systems and solar systems, we could save up to 40% of energy. In Los Angeles now, they have just now recently uh, uh, connected all the traffic lights, about 6,000 traffic lights, and they can save about 10% of gas in the daily commute. 10% of gas. So if you want to drive efficiency, that is a good business using AI, clearly. But it will eventually end, right? When you've made everything efficient, what is the next step? When the call center has been reduced from 100 million people to 10,000 people, what is the next step? You may maybe lose three more people, right? But so you have to also think about beyond efficiency. If your business plan is to, be, to make your clients efficient, that's a good plan. But it's not permanent, right? Efficiency is just one step in the value creation that you get for you. Ultimately, what we do with software now, it's following the, uh, the, uh, the path of the experience, right? It's going to the experience economy. So you go from the idea of saying, okay, the software is a service or a good or not an experience. It, it is supposed to cause some kind of transformation. What you're building when you're building AI is building transformative services that will change people's life. And that's ultimately what we're looking at, right? This is the, the shift of where this is going. I'll skip this as well. Now, one more point about the singularity, right? Um, Ray Kurzweil says in 2027, this point here is roughly when one human brain can be matched by one computer and the power of processing, 15 years. And then he says in 2050, all of human brains can be matched with one computer. That's because of the exponential laws of technology. We have to think about what that means, right? From the internet to sort of a brain net, right? That, that's kind of the idea, that our brains are connected. Obviously, that will be quite interesting. I think, to me, when you're looking at the scenario of what's happening here is that, that when we're looking at true intelligence, we should not look at an individual neuron or individual product, but at the network. The intelligence in the network. The intelligence in the connecting fact. When you're looking to make decisions, it's about being like a neural network like Metcalfe's law described. It's about ambient computing. We need to get to the end, so I'm going to rush a little bit ahead so we can ask a question. You can check this out on YouTube, it's called Screen. Uh, Screen has a very, very interesting algorithm that they have developed. Um, and what they say is they're using a software to, to uh, draw a complex inference, to collect data, to then say we can infer information from this. This is definitely a future path. You check it out on YouTube when we have a bit more time. And other companies are building Digital nervous system. sensors is sensing me. Oh, like this, right? Basically, the idea of saying that you connect information to build sensors to deliver kind of the intelligence you didn't have before, for, for example, in environmental systems and so on. The cognitive cloud that these guys have done, called cognitive scale, in the medical field, right? Think of the concept of a cognitive cloud. The idea of having information that thinks that comes along. That's a very, very powerful picture. I think we're going to see a lot more from this kind of people. Social media. I mean, this is a very rich turf, right? Connecting social media, sentiment analysis with artificial intelligence. I mean, Twitter is following that path already, just acquired a company you know, that does it, exactly this, two days ago. And so this is a crucial point. Take a look at social media. This company, this company called Cortex, does artificial intelligence marketing based on social media. Very powerful tool. So I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts and then get some questions if we still have time. First of all, Socrates said, nothing vast enters the life of mortals as us uh, with, without a curse. Sorry, that's, not, that's very good. <laughs> without a curse, not with a curse. So nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. 
Artificial intelligence is something extremely powerful. It's more powerful than nuclear power. We have to be aware of that. Nuclear power is bad enough. If things go wrong, then they go really wrong. Right? But India has lots of nuclear power plants, and many of them you need electricity right, for energy. Very important to keep that in mind. With this kind of idea of artificial intelligence, we're unleashing a very powerful thing. And we have to be aware that we have to have some remote situations, right? We have to think about the black swans, the unintended consequences. For example, security. I mean, if you're looking for a business opportunity, security, privacy, standards, all that stuff is a huge opportunity. Nobody is going to want to be involved with an intelligent system if it's not secure. Imagine what that system would do to you. I mean, it's bad enough as it is with the surveillance, right? And as a snow and so on. Imagine what would happen if 300 billion devices are connected to the internet. Your garage door opener, your car, your wristwatch, your clothes, your helmet, your pilot, right? But a very, very big thing. I think this is very important for business, social contracts, and thinking about the unintended consequences. When you're inventing a software that changes how people do things, you must think about the unintended consequences. Basically, the future will be about both of these things, technology and ethics and business values. And to me, the most important point is that we have to maintain what I call the human imperative. The human imperative is what Bhutan calls gross national happiness, right? rather than gross national product. Okay. The purpose of our work is to create happy customers. That is the human imperative. The purpose of our work is not to create software that buys itself. Right? I mean, we won't have customers, not robots. So human imperative, I think, is the key to success. Let me summarize. Uh, AI utilities are not about replacing humans, but about augmenting and empowering them. That is the purpose of what we're doing today. 20 years? We'll talk again. Right? But it's basically about uh, business super intelligence, software as an experience. I think it is a blessing, but generally it is a conquest. So I wish for, the, for you to uh, follow that rule in the, in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. I will make the slide available on my website or through the, through the organization, probably. The organization, I suppose. So your host will send you the PDF link. You can download this. We also made a video. Uh, thanks very much for listening.
research and the fact how to build super intelligent robots. That could quite possibly be a lot more serious than your power. So we need standards, we need, I mean, we have standards for everything. We have standards for bioengineering. We have standards for nuclear power. We're going to need that for data. I mean, and this is why I would advise you, take a look at intelligent assistance, IA, before you get into the top level goal of AI, right? There's so much work to be done on using intelligence to make augment what we do. That is an extremely powerful opportunity. And that will eventually become AI. But there are very large issues about leaving decisions to machines. For example, you may have followed the debate about the army saying that they want robots who can decide how to kill. I mean, imagine if you were an army commander, of course, you would like a robot that can decide. You don't have to call back and in the meantime they get destroyed, right? It sounds like a good thing, right? But is that a really good thing? How would a robot know that this little girl is not a walking landmine, an other robot for that matter, right? And would she want that a robot to decide that? And who would be responsible? And these are the decisions that we're going to have to face in this, right? So I think it's a lot easier for us to say, let's build the things that will make our life easier, right? and not that it will take over our lives, right? but potentially. I think that's a much better business plan for the time being. Uh, that's really what we're talking about here. Right? But we have to be aware that the potential of this technology is extremely powerful. And look at your kids, right? I mean, many of your kids, my kids at least, when I look at them, you know, they they have replaced some human function with the mobile phone, right? When you ask kids between 15 and 25 in most countries around the world, who is their best friend? You know what they say? It's the mobile. Now that is a sad story. Right? I think that will change again, right? But if the friend, is, if the mobile is your best friend, then you have a real social problem with this thing. Right. So that's, that's something we need to look at, right? We don't want people to become machines because they use machines. That would, that would defeat the whole world. So I think the best thing you can do is create a software that really does this really well, becomes very almost addictive to it, but empowers at the same time. There are great examples that do this already today. You don't take it too far, but take it far enough to be really exciting for people. Uh, we as in uh, people who develop software typically think about a particular domain. So uh, within financial, you have financial advice, you have investments. So we develop software for a particular domain. As AI becomes more prevalent, do you think the domain knowledge uh, would be, uh, the, the AI algorithm would be domain agnostic? As in um, Watson can do cookery shows, Watson can play quiz shows, Watson can uh, do medical diagnosis, Watson can do financial advice. So when we think of a future in which software is uh, software and AI become integrated, do we want to think of uh, the domain being inter uh, domain being separate from the algorithm, or domain being developed uh, the algorithm developing the knowledge through domain specialists or domain interactions? So is is, it, is the software going to be domain agnostic for yes. future software applications? Good point. I think the software can be agnostic. Uh, you can have software that can do all that, and IBM is trying to do that, for example, with Watson, right? You need the masters of that software to be extremely deep into the expert chip, right? To do the right thing. Otherwise, it could be potentially quite dangerous. Imagine if Watson would do medical advice or diagnosis right, without deep domain expertise of all the contextual things, right? I mean, it, that would be, because there's so many things that are not fact-based. Right? Uh, Isaac Asimov, who was a, a great uh, futurist and, and writer and science fiction author, he said, one point in his writing, he said that he does not want to be a speed reader. Machines can do the speed reading. He wants to be a speed understander. So let the machines be the speed readers. Right? We need to be the speed understanders. You know, understanding is quite different than reading, as I'm sure you know, right? I mean, when Sometimes when my clients say they want to know what happens in developing countries, I say go to India for two weeks and just stay there. Right? And then you're inside to understand, how you really understand when you're here. Right? You look at everything, you understand it. Right? You can't watch a YouTube video, that's not the same thing. Right? So I think the answer really is, I think software could be domain agnostic to a large degree. 
but how we apply it would be largely up to the experts to run it. And that will, that will probably be true for at least 20 years. I mean, we're talking about, again, the input I get from one person I talked to here, they input in terms of data, and the bandwidth doesn't even exist to copy this between people. So that's why we should be careful about it. You know, substituting one for the other. I mean, in financial services, clearly, if we have enough data, real-time data, social media data, transaction data, opt-in data, permission-based data, Internet of Things data, and you have the main expertise, you can build something pretty damn good. There's no doubt about that, my view. Much better than what we have now, that is for sure. It's like, you know, when you're looking at doctors, I, I do a lot of work with doctors, some people are saying that 80% of the work of a doctor could be replaced by a smart assistant or by a good nurse with a smart system. Diagnosis. I mean, simple diagnosis like a cold or a snake bite or whatever, right? And you're fairly straightforward. You're not talking about complex things, right? So the doctor in the near future, in five to ten years, most doctors will have free time, so to speak, because they're freed up from the manual work, like diagnosis, medication, prescribing, and they can learn do new things, right? They can be human again, right? They can talk to people again. So it becomes a whole different way of looking at what you do. The same is going to happen to bankers. They're going to say, well, psh, like the, the robot, I'm sitting on top of this robot, right? That makes me extremely agile and quick. But I have to run it. If I don't run the robot, it will just go wild. It won't have value. At least that's my view, I don't know. I think Ray Kurzweil would have a difficult opinion about saying that the computers should take over all of this. I don't agree. Anyway, another question or comment? We'll have a panel discussion later as well. Excuse me. So, so my question is, so when do you foresee Google running a proxy government for all the countries in the world? <laughs> well, they already do that. What do you mean? <laughs> now, Google is on its way of becoming the largest artificial intelligence company in the world. Okay? And that, that is what they're doing. Because, you know, in five years, if Google does not become what's called the global brain, right, the global OS, they're dead. Google makes 2.8 billion dollars a month with advertising. You know how it makes that? I go to the search and I type in Sushi Trivandro, right? I mean, that is the stupidest search you can think of, right? It's two keywords. Of course, it's very easy to make a match with keywords, right? That's like saying, I have a fungus thing that gives me medication, you know? And in five years, the system will know you. Right? You won't type anymore. You'll speak, or you just gesture, or right? and that is what Google wants to do. And that is a very scary thought. <coughs> well, I mean, I always say basically what's happening here is that those big companies like Baidu and Google and others and Facebook, they're becoming the new oil companies. Right? Exxon Mobil and Shell, and they have to be regulated just like the oil companies. Or they have to self-regulate. Somebody has to take a look at how they do it. I mean, Google has roughly two billion users, right? The internet in five years, in 2020, will have 6.1 billion users, and almost every one of those new users will be from India and China, right? From the new countries. And Google will be essentially running the OS, right? Will be the operating system of information. So that's something we have to think. About. Also, in terms of sovereignty, what kind of rights do we have in a system that's based in some of right? I'm not sure that's a good idea. <laughs> so, that's a political question. But as I was saying, um, I think the, the solution is not to say that we shouldn't do this because it's going to happen anyway. Right? We need to find a way to balance the benefit and the unintended consequence. You have another question or comment? Now we're getting into a deep discussion, we could probably talk until the rest of the day. But, uh, okay, uh, one more question? Or yeah, one more question. we have time for one more question. Yeah. You cannot build unbiased systems. It will be always biased. Right? But uh, when we look at some domains, we are creating systems for one particular domain. And uh, 
and based on a study. So how can it be biased? I couldn't get to your point. Well, by the very fact of what you're putting in, right? I mean, TripAdvisor says the same thing, right? TripAdvisor says, go to us to find out the honest opinion about this restaurant. But let me take 50 people from Manchester and send them to Malaga in Spain, right? And go to an Indian restaurant. Right? And the people from Manchester have, have been to the Indian restaurant once before. They go to this really bad place in Malaga. There's 50 people from one airplane, right? And they all write a review that the Indian place in Malaga is the best Indian place in the world. Right? So therefore, because there's 50 of them, right, the system said, well, there must be true. This place, and I've, I've had this problem, right? I go to Malaga, I go there, I have it. It's the worst ever, right? That's because these 50 didn't know that it was the worst, right? It was just lots of numbers. So for the system, this is the best place in Malaga, uh, in general, not just for India, right? But it's not true. So when you have a, you, know, you can't say that the data is unbiased just because of you're controlling its input. Well, the system is carefully balancing, you know, 100 million input feeds. And it's, you know, it's valuable in that it has so many, many more than humans can, right? And the bias is that it's a machine. It doesn't have any feelings about investing in an arms company, for example, right? I mean, the system just says, looks for profit, right? So it tells you to invest in uh, Lockheed Martin, right? But he would never invest in that. He wouldn't know that. So I think that's something to be very careful about. I think it's better to say that it has a bias because it is a machine, right? And that we accept that it's based on the left brain, right? And we don't want it to have right brain because that would really be confusing, in my view. I mean, I think if I was to advise, I would say, hey, but it's still working. That's the interesting part, right? It's still working, even though it's not true. So that, that shows you something. If you build a system where you say it's extremely useful because of what we put into it, and then you use your own judgment, I think that's the most powerful system you can have. OK, thanks very much for listening. See you later. Session. And uh, as a token of appreciation, I request you to accept this moment from Sarita. Okay. Sarita is part of Endless Communications. Ladies and gentlemen, Gart Yana. All right, so that was our keynote address on AI as a utility. We now go more into focus uh, into the financial services domain, keep taking investment as an example. Before I introduce the next speaker, I'd like uh, you to see a video over here on investment intelligence.